Okay, welcome back to our reading of The Tale of Despero. We are in chapter 37 today. Before I start, I'm going to give you a recap of what we read yesterday. So Roscuro has just revealed himself to Mig, and he's telling her his plan for Mig to become the princess and for Princess P to become the servant, although we know that that's not really his plan. His plan is that she'll stay in the dungeon forever, which is terrible. They went over the plan, and right now Princess Mig is about to enter Princess P's room to start the plan. And remember, she has a kitchen knife in one packet and Roscuro in the other packet. We're on chapter 37. A small taste. Princess P was asleep, dreaming of her mother, the queen, who was holding out a spoon to her and saying, Taste this, my sweet pea, taste this, my darling, and tell me what you think. The princess leaned forward and sipped some soup from the spoon her mother held out to her. Oh, Mama, she said, it's wonderful. It's the best soup I have ever eaten. Yes, said the queen. It is wonderful, isn't it? May I have some more, said the pea. I gave you a small taste that you would no long, that you would not forget, said her mother. I gave you a small taste so that you would remember. I want more. But as soon as the princess said this, her mother was gone. She disappeared, and the bowl and the soup spoon disappeared along with her. Remember, because this is a dream. Lost things, said the pea, more lost things, and then she heard her name. She turned, happy, thinking her mother had come back, but the voice was not her mother's. The voice belonged to somebody else, and it was coming from someplace far away and telling her to wake up, wake up. The pea opened her eyes and saw Miggery So standing over her bed, a knife in one hand and a candle in the other. Mig? she said. More, said Mig softly commanded Roscuro. Mig closed her eyes and shouted her piece. If you does not want to get hurt, princess, you must come with me. Whatever for, said the princess in an annoyed tone. As I have noted before, the princess was not a person who was used to being told what to do. What are you talking about? Mig opened her eyes and shouted, you got to come with me, so after we take some lessons, you you some long lessons and me some short ones. Together, Way down in the deep downs, I can be you and you can be me. No, shouted Rose Girl from Mig's pocket. No, no, you are doing it wrong. Who said that? Your Highness, said Rose Girl. And he call, crawled out of Mig's pocket and made his way up to her shoulder and situated himself there, laying his tail across her neck to balance himself. Your Highness, he said again. And he raised his spoon slowly off his head and smiled, displaying his mouth full of truly hideous teeth. I think it would be best if you do as Niggery so suggests. She is, as you can quite clearly see, in possession of a knife, a large knife, and she will use it if pushed, and she will, if pushed, use it. This is ridiculous, the pea said. You can't threaten me. I'm a princess. We, said Roscoe, Rose are all too aware of the fact of what you are. A knife, however, cares nothing for the fact that you are royalty, and you will bleed. I assume, just like any other human. The pea looked at Mig. Mig smiled. The knife glinted in the light of the candle. Mig, she said, her voice shaking in the tiniest bit. I really do not think, said Roscoe, that Mig would need much persuasion to use that knife, princess. She is a dangerous individual, easily led. But we are friends, said the pea, aren't we, Mig? Eh, said Mig. Trust me, said Roscuro, you are not friends, and I think it would be best if you addressed all your communications to me, princess. I am the one in charge here. Look at me. The pea looked right directly at the rat and at the spoon of his head. Her heart skipped one beat and then two. Do you know me, princess? No, she said, lowering her head. I don't know you. But reader, she did know him. He was the rat who had fallen into her mother's soup and he was wearing her dead mother's spoon on his head. The princess kept her head down. She concentrated on containing the rage that was leaping up inside her. Look again, princess, or do you not bear to look? Does it pain your royal sensibilities to, look, to let your eyes rest on a rat? I don't know you, she said, and I'm not afraid to look at you. The pea raised her head slowly. Her eyes were defiant. She stared at the rat. Very well, said Rose Girl. Have it your way. You do not need to know me. Nonetheless, you must do as I say, my, as my friend here has a knife. So get out of bed, princess. We are going on a little journey. 
I would like it if you dressed in your loveliest gown, the one you were wearing at the banquet not too long ago. So here's a picture of Princess P in her bed. There's Megary So, and there's Rose Girl on her shoulder. And put on your crown, said Meg. Put that on your princess head. Yes, said Rose Girl. Please, princess, do not forget your crown. The pea, still staring at Rose Girl, pushed the covers back and got out of bed. Move quickly, said Rose Girl. We must take our little journey while it is still dark and while the rest of the castle sleeps on. Ignorant, oh, so ignorant, I am afraid of your fate. The princess took a gown from her closet. Yes, said Rose Girl to himself. That is the one, the very one. Look at how it sparkles in the light. Lovely. I will need someone to do my buttons, said the princess as she stepped into the, into the dress. Meg, you must help me. Little princess, said Rose Girl, do you think that you can outsmart a rat? Our dear Megary so will not lay down her knife. Not even for a moment. Will you, Megary so? Because that might ruin your chances of becoming a princess. Isn't that right? Of course, said Meg, that's right. And so when Meg held the knife pointed in the direction of the princess, the pea sat and let the rat crawl over her back, doing her buttons up for her one by one. The princess held very still. The only movement she allowed herself was this. She licked her lips over and over again because she thought that she could taste their sweet saltiness of the soup and her mother that her mother had fed her in her dream. I have not forgotten, Mama, she whispered. I have not forgotten you. I have not forgotten soup. So Roscara and Meg are in the princess's room, and they're getting her to go down to the dungeon. Um, the princess P says that she doesn't remember Roscara, but I think she might remember him from falling into her mother's soup, but it's hard for her because she's so sad about it. Chapter 38. To the Dungeon. The strange threesome made their way down to the golden stairs of the castle. The princess and Meg walked side by side, and Roscaro hid himself again in the pocket of Meg's apron, and Meg pointed the sharp tip of the knife at the princess's back, and together they went down, down, down. The princess was led to her fate as around her. Everyone slept. The king slept in his giant bed with his crown on his head and his hand, dreaming that his wife, the queen, was a bird with green and gold feathers who called his name Philip, Philip without ceasing. Cook slept in a too small bed off the kitchen, dreaming of a recipe for soup that she could not find. Where did I put that, she mumbled in her sleep. Where did that recipe go? It was for the queen's favorite soup. I must find it. And not so far from Cook in the pantry, atop a bag of flour, the mouse Despero, dreaming, as you know, reader, of knights in shining armor, of dark and of light. And in the whole of the darkened sleeping castle, there was only the light of the candle in the hand of Megary So. The candle shone on the princess's dress and made it sparkle, and the princess walked tall in the light and tried not to be afraid. In this story, reader, we have talked about the heart of the mouse and the heart of the rat, but we have not talked about the heart of the princess. Like most hearts, it was complete. It was complicated. Shaded with dark and dappled with light, the dark things in the princess's heart were these. A very small, very hot, burning coal of hatred for the rat who was responsible for her mother's death. And the other darkness was a tremendous sorrow, a deep sadness that her mother was dead and that the princess could now only talk to her in her dreams. And what of the light in the princess's heart? Reader, I am pleased to tell you that the P was a kind person, and perhaps more important, she was empathetic. Do you know what it means to be empathetic? I will tell you. It means that when you are being forcibly taken to a dungeon, when you have a large knife pointed at your back, when you are trying to be brave, you are able still to think for a moment of the person who is holding that knife. You are able to think, oh, Poor Mig, she wants to be a princess so badly, and she thinks that this is the way. Poor, poor Mig. What must it be like to want something that desperately? That reader is empathy. And now you have a small map of the princess's heart, hatred, sorrow, kindness, empathy. 
the heart that she carried inside her as she went down to the golden stairs and through the kitchen, and finally, just as the sky outside of the castle began to lighten, down into the dark of the dungeon with the rat and the servant girl. So the author has just told us that all of these characters have light and a dark side to them that exist in each person. So we know that has, so for example, we know that Mick has had a really hard childhood. Her mother died when she was young and her father traded her. So that is a lot of sadness in Mig's heart. But we also know that Mig tries her best and that she, I think she's kind of funny. So those are the light things in her. And she really wants to be a princess. She has hope. Those are all the light things in Mig. And we've just learned that the princess, the darkness parts of her, are that she's so upset with this rat who has killed her mother. And she's also so sad that she only gets to see her mother in her dreams. But she also has a lot of light in her heart. The author tells us that she is very kind and empathetic. So we've learned that all of these characters have a light and a dark side of them. They have things that are beautiful about them and things that are still part of them. But they may be sad um, or angry for some reason. So we all have the light and the dark. And we are going to read one more chapter. Chapter 39. Missing. The sun rose and shed light on what Roscuro and Miggery so had done, and finally Duspero awoke. But alas, he awoke too late. I haven't seen her, Luis was shouting, and I tell you, I wash my hands of her. If she's missing, I say good riddance, good riddance to that bad rubbish. Despero sat up. He looked behind them. Him. Oh, his tail, gone. Given over to the knife, and where the, should the tail be? Nothing but a bloody stub. And more foul play? Gregory, dead, shouted Cook. Poor old man, that rope of his broken by who knows what and lost him in the dark and frightened to death because of it. It's too much. Oh no, whispered Despero. Oh no, Gregory is dead. The mouse got to his feet and began the long climb down from the shelf. Once he was on the floor, he stuck his head around the door of the pantry and saw Cook standing in the center of the kitchen, wringing her fat hands. Beside her stood a tall woman jangling a ring of keys. That's right, said Louise. All the king's men was down there searching for her in the dungeon. And when they came back up, what did they have with them? They had the old man, dead. And now you tell me that Mig is missing, and I say, who cares? Despero made a small noise of despair. He had slept too long. The rat had already acted. The princess was gone. What kind of world is it, Miss Louise, where the princesses are taken from right under our noses and queens drop dead and we cannot even take comfort in soup? And with this, Cook started to cry. Shh, said Louise. I beg you, do not say that word. Soup, shouted the cook. I will say it. No one can stop me. Soup, soup, soup. And then she began to cry in earnest, wailing and sobbing. There, said Louise. She put a hand to touch Cook and Cook slapped it away. It will be all right, said Louise. Cook brought the hem of her apron up to wipe her tears. It won't, she said. It won't be all right ever again. They've taken our little darling away. There ain't nothing left to live for without the princess. Despero was amazed to have exactly what was in his heart spoken aloud by such a ferocious, mouse-hating woman as Cook. Louise again reached out to touch Cook, and this time Cook allowed her to put an arm around her shoulder. What will we do? What will we do? wailed Cook. And Louise said, Shh, there, there. Alas, there was no one to comfort Despero, and there was no time anyway for him to cry. He knew what he had to do. He had to find the king. For, having heard Roscaro's plan reader, Despero knew that the princess was hidden in the dungeon. And being somewhat smarter than Miguri so, he sensed the terrible unspoken truth behind Roscaro's words. He knew that Mig could never be a princess, and he knew that the rat, once he captured the pea, would never let her go. And so, the small mouse, who had been dipped in oil, covered in flour, and relieved of his tail, slipped out of the pantry and passed the weeping ladies. He went to find the king. Okay, I have some questions for you. Remember to talk about these with someone who's reading the book with you or to write them down, send them to your teacher. So the first question is, what is the reaction of Luis, who, remember, is the head housekeeper? 
What is the reaction of Luis and the cook when they find out that the princess is missing? And what is Despero's plan to save the princess? Who is he going to tell? The second question is kind of a person. It's a personal question. It's not really about the book. It's kind of about you. So we learned in this chapter that print everybody has dark and light in them, and we learned about Princess P's dark side and light side. So we're all balanced. So there are some good things and there are some not so good things that happen to us, and that we hold in our heart. So I wonder if you can think about a dark part of your heart and a light part of your heart. So one thing, so the dark part may make you sad um, or angry or frustrated. The light part might make you really happy, something that you're proud of, something that makes you laugh. So I wonder if you can think about a dark part and a light part of your heart because we all have both in our hearts. So that's the personal question that you can keep to yourself if you'd like. But I want you to be thinking about that and to be thinking about the dark parts and the light parts of all of the characters' hearts. So that one you can keep to yourself and we can go over number one. So the first question was, what was the reaction of Luis and the cook? So it's the cook says, there is no point of even living if the princess is not here. So they love the princess so much. They are crying and they're so upset to hear that the princess is gone and Despero feels the same way remember he can hear them because he's still in the pantry and his plan is to go tell the king because he knows what Roscaro's secret plan is so he's going to try to save the princess okay we'll see what happens when we come back bye scholars